Welcome to Apologetics from the Attic, the show that seeks to teach and defend the Christian faith in a post-Christian culture. And now, broadcasting from an attic in an undisclosed location somewhere outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, here is your host, Dave Lewis. Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Apologetics from the Attic. I'm Dave Lewis. And today I wanted to jump back onto a series that I had started way back when the coronavirus uh, first broke out, where we were going through the Gospel of Mark. And I was looking at my podcast and looking at some things that we could do and some ideas. And I just thought that we should just keep going through the Gospel of Mark. I thought it was uh, going well and uh, just studying the scriptures is a good thing. And then I'm continuing my series on Catholic, Evangelical, and Reformed. And we did part one where we talked about the doctrine of the Trinity. But I introduced it by talking about the uh, fourfold scripture, tradition, experience, and reason. And you could go back and listen to that because we're, I'm, I'm stu- that's, that one's taking a lot more study than I, than I thought to do it in a way that I think is, is helpful uh, for the body of Christ. There's a lot of things going on in our world, of course, and there's many other competent men out there and women commenting on the things that are going on in our society with coronavirus and with the uh, stuff with um, racism and then the stuff with the Supreme Court decision. And um, I recommend uh, that you search, uh, listen to Albert Moeller, James White, Uh, Ben Shapiro is really good. I check him out all the time uh, for a perspective and uh, just... As Christians, we should stay um, connected to what's going on in the culture and apply a Christian worldview to it. And then, of course, just as Christians, we should continually study the scriptures, walk through the scriptures verse by verse, read them, and study them. And just just a note, you know, I, I've started the practice of reading through the Bible cover to cover, and we should always be doing that. And just a piece of advice, you know, something that gets me stuck, it's got me stuck over the years, and I realized that I was doing it, and it really helped once I realized it is, you know, I would read the Bible, and I would get stuck because there was something in me that I couldn't just read the Bible without stopping and analyzing everything. And I came to understand that I just need to read the Bible, regardless of whether I'm analyzing, understanding, exegeting, interpreting just read it. And then there's another point where you can study it, which is what we're going to do here. So if you want to go back and listen to the previous parts, we're jumping in the middle here, where where we left off last time was Mark chapter 3 and verse 20, around there, Jesus had just chosen his 12 apostles. Now, to put it back in context briefly, this is a section of the gospel of Mark where Jesus is in conflict with the religious leaders and his ministry. So there's there's three groups featured up to this point in, in Mark's gospel. Group one are the crowds who are attracted by Jesus' works of power. So Jesus has uh, demonstrated authority over the man with the unclean spirit, and those who witnessed it were amazed that he had the authority to cast out demons. And then he's healed probably thousands of people. And then if you remember in Mark 1, he cleansed a leper, which involved him touching a leper. And it's my opinion that when word got out, because Jesus told the man not to go spread the word that he he got cleansed of his leprosy by Jesus, I think the man went about and said, this man touched me. And of course, what happens when you touch a leper? Well, you become unclean. And I'm convinced that that's what, that's what drew the attention of the religious leaders of Jesus' day. And then the religious leaders all of a sudden were on the scene when Jesus healed the paralytic. And go back and listen to that episode uh, because I made a huge point and it's, it, this is, it's like determinative of the entire Gospel of Mark, in my opinion. Jesus makes the claim that his miracles... His ability to heal is pointing to the greatest miracle or the reason why he came, which is to forgive sins. So 
the problem that the crowds have and the problem that, that is had, you know, in a theology of glory, as we call it, is that we think that the main reason Jesus came to this earth was to heal our earthly circumstances. And Jesus does demonstrate in his earthly ministry the power to cure almost every ill that affects our society. He has authority over the demonic. He can heal every sickness. He can raise people from the dead. He can control the weather. And he can feed people with unlimited food by a miraculous touch. When he touches a loaf of bread, it's able to feed thousands of people. So hunger, demonic activity, disease, death, the weather, natural disasters. He has control over all those things, the things that cause us pain. Yet, that is not why he came. He's just giving us a foretaste of the kingdom to come. But the kingdom he's proclaiming in the Gospel of Mark is the kingdom that brings the forgiveness of our sins. And that's what he says to the Pharisees. And that's the thing about that healing is you expect him to say to the man, get up and take up your mat and walk at the beginning. But he doesn't. He says, your sins are forgiven. And then the Pharisees, of course, get upset because they rightly say, that only God can forgive sins. And then just, and Mark compacts this material where Matthew and Luke kind of spread it out a little more. Jesus's conflict with the, the religious leaders. And then of course, Jesus gets, draws their ire because <clears throat> he's hanging out with a tax collector named Levi and he's hanging out with quote unquote sinners and he gets in trouble for that. And then they challenge him because his disciples aren't fasting. So they're not conforming to their prescribed religious rituals. And then they challenge Jesus for eating grain on the Sabbath, picking and eating grain on the Sabbath, and Jesus rebukes them. This is all in the previous episodes. If you want to check those out, I don't want to go. We already went deeply into these in the other episodes. And then um, kind of the uh, ultimate um, betrayal or thing that angers them is that he heals a man with a withered hand on the Sabbath and the Pharisees and the Herodians make an alliance and they want to kill him. So, you know, these two chapters in Mark, the end game here for the Pharisees and the religious leaders are that we need to kill this guy because he is blaspheming and breaking the Sabbath and he is a, a, a lawbreaker. And then... These crowds follow Jesus. Uh, Mark makes a comment about them following Jesus, and there's so many of them that... So then we have these crowds. So the crowds are another one of the characters. And then Jesus picks the 12. And that's where we're going we're gonna to pick up here. He's picked the 12 apostles. And um, verse 20 is where we're going to start, Mark 3.20. Then he went home. So this is after he's picked and selected his 12 apostles. Then Jesus went home and a crowd gathered again so they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him for they were saying he's out of his mind. So remember, one of the things that we need to do when we read um, the scripture is we have to try to understand what the original audience of the of the text would have gotten out of the text as well as apply grammatical historical interpretation to it. And this is a this is an aspect of gospel studies that I have didn't really get into till I went into seminary and started studying it more deeply. So the original audience that would have read Mark would have been under persecution probably, and they would have been struggling with the family ties that they had, and they would have struggled with the um, issue of converting to Christianity, and it would cause a great uh, division within their family. And that still happens today. And there's things in here. Um, the Holy Spirit, through the writer of the Gospel of Mark, selects material. Because, of course, it doesn't record everything Jesus said and did. But it selects material that would be relevant to those who are following Christ in the early church. Because remember, this document is a church document. It's written for the church for those who follow Christ, for those who've been called out to follow Jesus. So um, this is a comfort to know 
that even our master and savior and Lord Jesus, his own family, said he was out of his mind. <laughs> his own family were like, this is crazy. What's going on? So I, th- I think that's a, the, I mean, because because you, because you read that, you're like, well, that's like two sentences that seem out of place. Like, what do you, what do you mean? What's his family saying is out of his mind? And then it continues because that, that theme continues. So now we have the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit text. So let's read this paragraph or two, and then we'll make some comments on it. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, He is possessed by Beelzebul, and by the prince of demons he casts out demons. So here's where the, because we have already heard, right, that the scribes and the Pharisees are plotting to kill Jesus. So here is where they are going to start to lay out their strategy to turn the crowds against Jesus. Because the bottom line is, if you have these crowds that are flocking to see Jesus, the religious leaders and authorities are going to have a hard time condemning him when that crowd is so supportive of him. It's just not going to work. Um, you, you, the Gospels talk about this, that, um, that they're actually afraid of the crowds, the religious leaders. So that's why they have to strategically arrest him at night, for example on the outskirts of Jerusalem when they arrest him in the Garden of Gethsemane. They can't arrest him openly while he's publicly teaching because the crowd will turn on them. Um, and, and we've seen how mobs and crowds act uh, recently. Uh, so it, w- <laughs> human nature hasn't changed very much, okay? Crowds and mobs uh, act in a crazy ways back then, just like they do now. Um, but the charge they're lodging, is that the power that's at work in Jesus to heal, to cast out the demonic, is satanic. If you think about that charge, just for a moment, I mean, it's crazy. So you look at the Jesus of Nazareth's healing, put yourself in the shoes of someone living back then, and you see him do these miracles, and you're like, yeah, that's demonic. It shows you the depth of the deception that people can be under attacking Jesus. And and we're going to see that's really what this is about. This is about um, laying out the people against Jesus and what their motivations are and how they think and, and what they are uh, doing. And and it's important for us to see that. And he called them to him and said to in parables, how can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but is coming to an end. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Then, indeed, he may plunder his house. Truly, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the children of man and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemies against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. Where they were saying he has an unclean spirit. There's a lot there, but we can just summarize. Jesus' point is, if you are claiming that I cast out Satan by the power of Satan, that makes no sense because why would Satan drive out himself in from areas that he already has under his control? Why would he cede ground like that? Why would he give up ground like that if in fact Jesus, and if in fact he already has this um, territory, right? That's that's the main sense. And then, of course, Jesus is talking about that he is the strong man and his ministry is the binding of Satan himself. And he is plundering Satan's house. And just, just think about that for a moment. That is comforting that we know that Jesus has victory over, as the Lutherans say, I like how they summarize it, sin, death, and the devil. I guess it goes back to Luther himself. Sin, death, and the devil. Jesus <clears throat> binds and defeats our three greatest enemies and adversaries, sin, death, and the devil. He delivers us from the condemnation that we deserve for our sin. He delivers us from death, the fear of death. And he delivers us from the devil and Satan's power. And Jesus has the power to bind the strong man. So that first part's, you know, it's it's not super complicated. 
Jesus is saying, it's ridiculous for you to say that I'm driving out Satan by the power of Satan because that makes no sense. Why would Satan give up ground that he already has? And then secondly, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. So what does this mean? And this is a one where you can get into the commentaries. Um, you know, there's, there's three main views that I've heard. Um, I remember when I was a student at Teen Challenge way back in 2001, there was a guy who, who, you know, we became friends in the program and he came to me and he was like, Dave, I, I, I've, I've committed the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And I, and back then I, you know, I was still learning Christianity myself. I was just newly converted. I didn't know anything. And he was basically like, I'm going to hell. There's no way I'll be forgiven. I've, and he's, he's going from this verse, um, you know, I'll never have forgiveness. And, and it's like, well, what, what did you do? Oh, well, I practiced witchcraft before. I was into Wiccan stuff and witchcraft stuff. So that means I'm not saved. And all I could say to the guy at the time was, well, you probably should go talk to a pastor or counselor up here, man, because I don't know what to tell you. I can't, I don't understand what this blasphemy of the Holy Spirit means. Um, so, you know, I regret that I didn't have a better, better answer to give the guy. Um, and, and if you're a pastor or in ministry, you'll, you'll get this from some people. They'll, uh, say, well, I'm, I'm guilty of, of a sin. Now, now what I would say now to someone like that is the first thing I would emphasize is I think if you committed the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit in, in that understanding of it, like it's a, it's a thing you can do that once you do it, there's no way you can be forgiven for it, which I, I, I don't think that's. A correct interpretation but let's say that's your interpretation if you're feeling bad about it i don't think you've done it i would think that if that's if if you if there's this thing called the blasphemy of the holy spirit that's so bad that you'll never be forgiven of it and it's a sin you can commit uh in time one time i think you'd never feel guilty for it i think you would just be like yeah i've done it and i'm proud of it and i don't, I don't really care about being forgiven for it so the fact that 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 young man had guilt and was struggling with he may have committed that sin, I think is evidence that he didn't commit it. But anyway, so view one is that it's some sin you can commit, whatever, uh, right now. And then once you commit it, you're never forgiven. That's more like a minority view. I think that the two main views are the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is a continual attitude. Now, well, first of all, let me back up. Clearly, what is not under dispute is the specific thing that the Pharisees and the scribes here are doing is they're attributing the power of Jesus, which is through the Holy Spirit. Remember, it's the triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit. So everything that's done by one person in the Trinity, all three are involved. So when Jesus is, is doing these miracles, it's by the power of the Holy Spirit. They're attributing the power of the Holy Spirit to Satan. It's a very specific thing they're doing. It's not just this general, like that, 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 that yeah, young man, oh, I did witchcraft one time. That's blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Well, clearly in the context here, it's not talking about witchcraft. It's not talking about some specific, like, violation of the, of the Ten Commandments or violation of God's law. It's a specific thing they're doing. They are attributing the power of Jesus to demonic sources. Okay. So that's very important. I think that that's determinative of how you interpret this text. If you try to branch it out and generalize it more and say, oh, no, it's just this general sin issue. Well, that's not that's not what it's saying. It's saying it's a it's the um, attributing the work of Jesus to de the devil. So the two major views is that's this is more it is, this is less of a one time act as it is an attitude and the reason why you can never have forgiveness is because the Holy Spirit is the one who draws you to Christ. And if you are actively calling the person who draws you to Christ demonic, then clearly you'll never come to Christ. Um, another view is you actually can't commit this sin today. The only time you could commit the sin was when Jesus walked to the earth. Now, because Jesus is not no longer incarnate in, in his earthly ministry, and he has died and raised in the seat at the right hand of God, you cannot commit this sin anymore. Now, the problem I have with that view is it, it, it really renders the purpose of the gospel 
being written and this being recorded as somewhat irrelevant for uh, the ones who would read and study this text, which, as I said earlier, the Holy Spirit clearly inspired the recording of this text and the rest of the texts of the Gospels for us to be instructed by. But certainly, I think the, the interpretation that we can rule out, out of hand, is, well, this is just some one-time sin you can commit. It's an action you take, and once you do it, you'll never be forgiven. I think it's more of an attitude, and I think it's more of an attack on the very uh, nature of Jesus Christ. So, um, for they were saying he had an unclean spirit. Um, and then here's another, uh, and then we continue on this theme of family relations, which I think was an issue in the community that Mark was writing to. Because remember, and this is important, I mean, many of you listening to this have probably never heard this angle. Now, this angle can go way too far, and you can start to try to deconstruct what's behind the text of Mark and why it was like, but you want to ask the question, what may have been going on in the community of believers that would have first received this uh, gospel, this written account, this gospel that would apply to their situation that they were going through as a body of believers in the Greco-Roman Empire. It's important. It, it, It sheds light on a lot of things. So what would have been going on, you know, even this previous text? I mean, were were there people saying that these quote-unquote Christians, these followers of Christ, were demonic, demonically inspired, and that's what they were, and, and they were lodging that accusation against them. And here's a text that would help instruct and comfort them in that. Uh, selecting what Jesus taught to apply to specific situations. I think you have to take that more seriously than some Reformed and Evangelical views of the gospel take that particular interpretive grid. Now you can take it too far and say all of the gospels are this subjective situational thing. No, they also contain, this is the, this is the wonder of the scripture. It's written to an audience in a time and place that we need to understand, but it's also intended for the body of Christ moving forward for millennia. So we're sitting here studying it 2,000 years later, and it's still being used by the Holy Spirit to speak to us in our circumstances and in our situations. So anyway, I just want, don't want to say that. I don't want to go too off on a tangent on that, but it's an important thing to understand. Okay, verse 31, chapter 3 in Mark. And his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. And a crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. And he answered them, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking about at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. Now you read that and you go, What is the point there? Like Jesus doesn't like his family. Jesus is rejecting his own family, his mother and his brother and sisters. What? Because remember, Jesus had... You know, Mary was his earthly mother. He's the incarnate son of God, but he took upon himself, you know, in the womb of the virgin, a human nature. So he's united to a human nature that he got from his mother. And he and Mary, apparently, you know, this is debated um, for especially those who want to hold to the perpetual virginity of Mary, um, that these these aren't really blood relatives, the brothers and sisters. Um, But anyway. What, what in the world is this? Well, this is where what I'm saying about the interpretive context of those who would receive the gospel, Mark, think about how comforting this is. If you have been rejected, maligned by your own family, and because you are following Christ, you have faced the ire of your mother, your brothers, your sisters, and anyone that's related to you. Well, Jesus is saying, listen, if you are in Christ, you have a new family. And of course, he's not saying, you know, reject your earthly family. But what he's saying is, if they um, are rejecting you, if they are not, because remember, we they, they think he's out of his mind. If they are rejecting you, 
um, don't worry about it because you have a new family. You have a bigger family. You have a higher family, and that is those who do the will of God. And of course, the church as the church and as believers, we need to offer family, community to those who have none. Because we live in a very broken culture where the nuclear family has been devastated by many, many things. In all communities, by the way, not just African-American community or whatever. The, 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 the white community in America is also ravaged. I mean, the divorce rate is high. Children born out of wedlock is high. It's not just you know one ethnicity struggles with that. So we live in a culture where people didn't experience family, and we as a church need to be that. Okay, so what, what's what's the time here? I don't want to. I don't want these to be super long. We're almost at thirty minutes. So let's just introduce the parable, what's classically called the parable of the sower, which is more correctly called the parable of the soils, um, because. It's more focused on the types of soil that the seed falls on. So first of all, let's put this in context. I think that this is placed here in the Gospel of Mark because we are now going to get some insight into why is it that Jesus is going around, demonstrating his power over the demonic, healing thousands of people, okay, and he's demonstrating this power and authority that he has. Why is it that he can preach, teach, and do miracles and yet not be received and believed in? Why are people refusing to do what he said they need to do? Remember at the beginning of the Gospel of Mark, what's he going around preaching? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Follow him, believe in him, because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Why is it that the response from the Pharisees, why is it the response from the crowds, and then even why the response from the disciples, his inner circle, they even don't believe in him right away, and they don't understand who he is and what he's come to do? What's the explanation for that? Why are, In other words, why are there different responses to the proclamation of repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Why are there different responses? Why doesn't everyone just instantly respond to that message, fall to their knees and say, Jesus Christ is Lord. I repent of my sins. He is the king. His kingdom is coming. I swear my allegiance to him as the king. Why doesn't everybody do that? Why is there this opposition to him? Why are people claiming that he's demonic? Why are people wanting to kill him? Why are these crowds gathering who really have no understanding of what he is any more than just a miracle worker? Well, that's the explanation. Jesus uses a parable to explain why there's different responses to the proclamation of the kingdom. So let's just begin that, and then in the next part we'll continue it, because there's a lot of material here that it's going to take us way too long to cover for one episode. Mark chapter 4, verse 1. And he, Jesus, began to teach beside the sea. And a very large crowd gathered about him, so that he got into a boat and sat in, sat in it on the sea. And the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land. So, you know, smart little um, technique there. So the, the crowd's not going to sit there and tread water for hours <laughs> trying to get to Jesus. So just put the boat out in about 10 foot, 8 foot of water. And, you know, no one's going to mess with you. Anyway. And as Jesus was teaching them many things in parables, and in his teaching he said to them, Listen, a sower went out to sow. So sowing, planting, somebody who's planting seed. okay. And as he sowed or planted seed, some seed fell along the path and the birds came and devoured it. So one of the things about this parable that strikes you right away um, is the sower is seems to be indiscriminately scattering seed, which if you study the agriculture of the time, I, I think that 
that was one way of sowing seed. Um, another way of sowing seed is, I mean, I have a bunch of tomato plants, hot pepper plants, and some pepper plants that I, they're doing actually rather well. Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll cut a, a picture of it for the, for those of you watching as I edit, when I edit this video, I'll show you. Um, I sowed all these plants from seeds and I didn't just scatter them upon, uh, some soil somewhere. I actually purposely, uh, planted each seed in one of those little pods. Uh, those seed starter pods until they started growing and then I transplanted them into a bigger pot. But um, I purposefully sowed the seed. This seems to be more of the idea of, a, of and I guess this was done back in the day, you, you plow a field and you have a large bag of seed and you just walk up and down and you just throw the seed out indiscriminately and some will fall into the plowed field and will turn into a crop. I don't think anybody does that anymore, any farmers. I mean, there's all farming equipment that, that plants the seed for you into the field where you need it to be. But that's what he's doing. And then, remember, this is not the emphasis on the parable. Although, you know, calling it the parable of the sower may be the emphasis because the question is, do we prepare the soil? How is the soil prepared? Because the soil represents the human heart. So as he sowed, some, feed fell, some seed fell along the path and the burst came and devoured it. So uh, just use your imagination. So somebody's um, sowing seed and they're throwing it and there's a hard path, like a sidewalk or back in that day, it would have just been a, a, a roadway that people walk back and forth um, and it's packed down and seed falls there. It doesn't do anything. I mean, if you, if you threw some seed on a sidewalk, the birds would come eat it. I mean, even where I live in a the city, their birds would, if I threw some seed down the sidewalk, the birds would come and they would, they would eat the seed. Other seed fell on rocky ground where it did not have much soil and immediately it sprang up since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched and since it had no root, it withered away. So anyone who knows about gardening or growing plants, if you don't plant the seed, especially if you're planting a seed just like directly into the garden. Now, if you're sowing a seed, if you're planting a seed like in a planter in a greenhouse, you don't have as much of a problem because you're kind of shielding the new plant from the sun. But if you plant a seed in a, in a garden and exposed to the natural sun, if you don't plant it deep enough, the problem is it, it, will, it doesn't have enough time to, to uh, grow the roots those initial roots have to, so, so in other words, the deeper you plant it, the more time those roots have to grow first while the top part is growing. And by the time the top part pops up and starts getting sunlight, there's enough roots to sustain that sunlight. Because if you don't have enough root, um, it'll wither away. The sun will scorch it, which is, is true. Other seeds fell among thorns and the thorns grew up and choked it and yielded no grain. And other seeds fell into good soil and produced grain, growing up and increasing and yielding 30-fold and 60-fold and 100-fold. And he said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. So the parable is pretty straightforward, right? There's four types of soil where the seed falls. There's the path, there's the rocky soil, there's the thorny soil, and then there's the good soil. And the difference is the first three soils render the seed and the plant that grows, that it doesn't bear any fruit. The fourth soil is the only soil that renders the seed able, and it produces fruit. And then Jesus explains what the parable is. Now notice verse 9. And he said to him, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. So the hearing, not just hearing with the eardrum and having the physical ability to hear, but hearing in a deeper way is what's at stake here. So when the word of God goes forth, there's a hear type of hearing that certain people will have and certain people will not have. So Jesus proclaims that he who has ears to hear let him hear. And when he was alone, 
Those around him with the twelve asked him about the parables. And he said to them, To you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God, but for those outside everything is in parables, so that they may indeed see but not perceive, and may indeed hear but not understand, lest they should turn to be forgiven. Now, let's stop right here. Jesus explains why he speaks in parables to the crowds, but he doesn't explain the meaning of the parables. Because the whole thing about a parable is it's a earthly analogy or metaphor or example of something. So he, so everyone's familiar with farming because it's a farming, it's an agricultural society. Everyone's familiar with someone planting seed and yeah, of course, if it goes on the path, the birds lead it. Yeah, of course, if it's not deep enough soil, it'll wither away. Of course, if it's in a thorny area, that, that's not going to be able to grow right. Of course, you have to plant, plant the seed only on good soil. Um, you know, it's something that's understood in that sense. But there's no explanation, notice. Jesus doesn't say, and they, here's what, he doesn't say to the crowd. He doesn't say, here's what the soils are. Here's what the sower is. Here's what these, here's what the thorns represent. Here's what this represents. He does that only to the disciples. Okay. And, but he's making a proclamation to the general crowds. Now, he quotes, and we'll close here, and we'll go more in depth into this next time. He quotes from Isaiah that text so that they may indeed see but not perceive and may indeed hear but not understand lest they should turn and be forgiven. This is from Isaiah chapter 6, the great missionary text where, and it's interesting, for generations, the missionary movement in the United States of America, Western Christianity has used this text to call missionaries to the mission field, which is great. Okay. Because remember, this is Isaiah six. We don't have to, we can't, I don't want to go through all of it, but remember, read it for yourself. Isaiah chapter six, verse one. This is where Isaiah has this vision of the seraphim flying around the throne of God, crying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. He has this amazing uh, encounter with the Lord. And if you've never read or watched or listened to R.C. Sproul's teaching called The Holiness of God or his book called The Holiness of God, that's a must read and a must watch. Um, he goes over this in depth and he's powerful the way he exposits this uh, encounter Isaiah has with the Holy God. But anyway, Isaiah has this encounter and this encounter with holiness causes him to call down curses upon himself and declare that he has unclean lips and he lives amongst a people of unclean lips and God sends the seraphim with the, with the coal and it touches his lips and his sin is atoned for and his sin is forgiven. Um, he, he's, he's, he's ministered to the forgiveness of his sins. And then, I, and then I, in the context of that, Isaiah is the man who's been shocked by a revelation of the holiness of God shocked by a revelation of his own sin and that sin before holy god has been forgiven okay then it continues isaiah chapter 6 verse 8 and i heard a voice of the lord saying whom shall i send and who will go for us then i said here i am lord send me so isaiah responds so the so god calls someone to go this is the commissioning of isaiah as a prophet okay very important to understand and he said, after Isaiah accepts this commission, I will go. And he said, go and say to this people. Now listen, this is the proclamation. This is the ministry of Isaiah. Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their eyes heavy and blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. So Isaiah's ministry is to bring hardness, blindness, deafness upon the people. Because clearly, if God so chose, he could cause the preaching of Isaiah to result in mass salvation and revival. That's why it says, lest they turn. In other words, if God so chose he could give his word success, or back to the, the, the parable of Mark, he could, if he so chose, cause all the seed to fall on good soil and bear fruit. 
but there's something else going on here. And what is going on is judgment. What's going on is judgment. And then Isaiah himself is shocked by this. In verse 11, he says, how long, O Lord? So in other words, Isaiah's like, so, so God, you're, you're sending me to a ministry that's going to blind and harden people and make it so they can't hear, they can't understand, they can't see. And that's what I'm supposed to do? Yes. How long? So how long is this supposed to go on? This prophetic ministry of hardening. I mean, understand this. This is not understood by the church. That many times God's ministry that he would call you to is not always to have this huge success. I mean, if you're a pastor today, your whole, when you get around other pastors, your whole thing is, well, how many people come to your Sunday morning service? How many attendants? How big is your church? 500, 1,000, 25? Oh, the pressure among pastors to get numbers is amazing. And when that becomes your main focus, you can lose focus on God may be calling you to bring hardness upon some as well. Sometimes the lack of success in converts coming to Christ can be attributed to a mysterious work God is doing to bring judgment. So what is going on in Isaiah? It says, how long, O Lord? He says, until the cities lie waste without inhabitant, the houses without people, and the land is a desolate waste, and the Lord removes people far away, and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. And though a tenth remain in it, it will be burned again, like a terebinth or an oak whose stump remains when it is felled. The holy seed is its stump. Did you just hear that? Did you connect? Whoa, whoa, it just said seed. And Jesus is talking about sowing seed. Very good. This is a entire study about how the Old Testament is cited in the New. And it's called The Echoes of Scripture. Um, famous scholar Richard Hayes wrote a book. I have it over here. It's called Echoes of Scripture in the Letters of Paul. So he does, I don't know if there's, I'm sure there's been studies done on how this is in the Gospels as well. But Hayes uh, shows very convincingly that when Paul quotes a piece of an Old Testament text, he is actually echoing the entire passage or context of the text. So he shows that even though one little verse is quoted, um, the entire chapter or pericope, it's called in scholarly terms, is, is thought of by the, the biblical author. So I think that Jesus is showing us that there's a deeper meaning here. The seed that's being sown will come about because he is going to have the judgment turned upon himself. In other words, in the Old Testament, God sends Isaiah in order to preach to Israelites. And we know the end result of the ministry of Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and the other prophets. It's judgment comes. They refuse to listen. They harden their heart. They stiffen their neck. They refuse to repent. And God ultimately exiles them out of the promised land. That's what's going to happen in the ministry of Jesus. In the ministry of Jesus, why is it that the Pharisees and the crowds and even the disciples do not bear fruit in good soil until after the resurrection? Because judgment is being brought about. But that judgment is going to be turned upon Jesus. That judgment is going to fall upon him as he's cursed and hung on a tree called the cross. Now, there's also a secondary meaning here about the judgment upon the Jewish people. But we shouldn't make that our primary understanding of this text. There is a sense in which in 70 AD, 
judgment will come upon the Jews. And by the way, just a side note, I found these this video series. Um, I forget what it's called, but it's on YouTube, where these guys do this great animation and they reenact all kinds of uh, military battles, and they tell the history of it. They're cool. They're like thirty minute videos, and they show all the military strategy. And they have one about the destruction of Jerusalem in seventy A.D. And it's 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 quite fascinating about how the Jews raised a rebellion and had they I mean they had an army they were trying to to uh, you know destroy the Romans and and the Romans just they had overwhelming force back then and they sent legions down there and then took them out but um, they the Jews fought valiantly to try to um, you know beat beat back the Roman occupation of of Judea and they couldn't anyway um, the destruction of the temple and the destruction which which was in church history um, interpreted as uh, the the judgment of God falling upon the Jews for their rejection of Christ. Now we could debate whether that's the case or not, but um, you know there's also this judgment of the Israelites because of their rejection of the Messiah. But let's not get caught up in that because the primary interpretation here, I think, is Jesus is taking upon himself that precedent that is set in Isaiah chapter six, where his ministry is that of judgment is coming. But the difference between Jesus and Isaiah is Isaiah had to have his own sin atoned. Jesus is going to provide atonement for sinners when he dies on the cross. So that's all we have time for today. I hope that was helpful. We'll continue in our study of the Gospel of Mark. And stay tuned. And thank you for listening to and watching another episode of Apologize from the Attic. Thanks and God bless.